folks who are still grabbing food, please uh, go ahead and do that. But I'm going to go ahead and get started with just a few uh, welcomes and announcements and those kinds of things as people are filtering in and finding their spots. Um, Happy New Year and Happy welcome. New Year. I'm Sue Blocky. I'm from the Prevention Research Center for Healthy Neighborhoods. And this is our monthly seminar series. Um, I'd like to welcome you if this is your first time. Welcome. Um, we do have a sign-in sheet. If you didn't sign in, please do that. It really helps us track um, who we're serving with this seminar, and it also allows us to reach you with announcements about um, upcoming talks and other special events that we have that might be of interest to you. Um, this is open to everyone, so please feel free to share. Uh, if we send you an announcement and you think somebody might be interested, please feel free to forward that. Um, they don't need to be part of the case community. Uh, it could be beyond. Uh, this is open to all, including uh, residents, um, friends, and family. Um, so today's presenter is Monica Webb Hooper, and she is actually new to uh, Case Western Reserve University as of this past June. So you've been here just about six months. It's hard to believe it's been that long. Um, but um, Dr. Hooper was uh, recruited to be the director of the Office of Cancer Disparities Research for the Case Comprehensive Cancer Center. Um, that is a major role um, and a major initiative that is now being launched. Um, she's professor of oncology, family medicine, community health, epidemiology, biostatistics, and psychological sciences. Um, so she has a multidisciplinary uh, approach to things and, and is quite connected into multiple uh, departments here. Her research has really focused in on tobacco and tobacco cessation and um, strategies that um, are uh, culturally tailored, is that a fair way to say it? I'm sure we'll, we'll learn a little bit more. Um, and her current funding is with the American Cancer Society, um, and I think we're going to hear a little bit more about that project today mm -hmm. and directions that it's going. <laughs> um, I do know that she's got an office now in this building on the fourth floor, so we're really excited to have her um, locally situated um, so that we can interact uh, around some of the, the work that she's doing. Um, we'll spend a little bit of time on the presentation and then transition into uh, time for discussion um, where we'll you know, take questions and uh, kind of see where things go. We will wrap up by 1.15. Um, and I'm always uh, reminded to say that we do live tweeting. Hashtag is over there on the board. Hashtag PRCHN seminar. Um, if you would like to do any live tweeting, and I know you're out there. Um, but with that, Please welcome Martha. So, thank you very much. Uh, it is an absolute delight to be able to be here with you today and have an opportunity to present at this really fantastic seminar. Um, as Dr. Flocky mentioned, I am new to CASE. It's been seven months now. I'm not really counting. Um, and, you know, things are, things are moving along. And in thinking about what I present today, I was thinking, first, I would kind of use the traditional approach of telling you about specific aims and data collection and results. But then I decided because I am a new faculty member and my approach as a clinical health psychologist is quite different from most of my colleagues in the School of Medicine and you know in the Cancer Center, that I would take a little bit more of a broad approach and talk about you know the approach of clinical psychology as it relates to tobacco use. How does that fit in into the larger landscape of t the tobacco control movement? And I was honored this past summer to give an invited address at the American Psychological Association's um, anniversary. It was the 38th anniversary of Division 38, which is health psychology. And in that address, I was asked to um, think about the contribution of health psychology and clinical health psychology to the tobacco control movement. And I thought, well, that's a really big question to think about how a field has contributed to something as important as tobacco control. Um, and so in doing that, I said, you know, I think it might be really interesting to get some expert opinion. So not just me giving my opinion about some of these contributions, but to gather, you know, some of my friends and colleagues in the field who've made seminal contributions to the development of theories or expand the expansion of theory. Um, who've made seminal contributions to intervention development or understanding 
um, the mediation or the explanatory variables that help us understand who is successful when they attempt to quit smoking and who is not, and how we can improve the efficacy of interventions. So if all goes well, you'll be able to hear from some of these individuals through little video clips where they were asked to respond to the question that I was asked was, you know, what do you think the top three contributions would be of clinical, of clinical health psychology, health psychology more broadly, to the tobacco control movement. So as we go through, you will hear from some of them. So I'm excited. That's my exciting emoji. <laughs> and uh, we'll see how this goes. So I think this group probably knows that tobacco is our most important public health problem. It kills more people than everything else you can think of combined. So it's a real problem. And we know that um, it will never really be gone away. Um, and now there are new emerging and alternative products that are, that are on the market. The tobacco industry always manages to be steps ahead of us. But it's responsible for lots of death and disease. And this uh, was taken from the most recent Surgeon General's report on the health consequences of tobacco use. And this was the 50th anniversary since the original report that, um, that confirmed that smoking cigarettes causes cancer. Um, and what you can see is over time, tobacco use has been responsible for almost 21 million deaths in this country. This was just up to 2014, which is a huge, huge number from a variety of concerns. What I found, among other things, particularly striking about this report, was that as much as we know, and we think we know, about the dangers of tobacco use, there's still more to learn. There's still so much more work to be done. Um, everything in red represents new findings that were in the report about new um, conditions that are caused by or, or highly suggestive to be caused by tobacco smoking. So for example, adding two more cancers to the list that weren't um, causes of cancer before, let's go back, and then also a list of other things like diabetes. Like we've all known that diabetes is made worse by people uh, continuing to smoke cigarettes, but we never really thought about tobacco use as a causative factor in the development of diabetes, and so now we know that's the case. And we've made tremendous strides since we first started tracking and really trying to initiate the tobacco control movement. We know that from 1965 through 2014, the prevalence of tobacco use in the United States has been on the decline, has dramatically declined. Over 50 million people since that first uh, Surgeon General's report have quit smoking successfully, so we know it's something that can be done. The smokers of today, however, seem to be a bit more recalcitrant than the smokers who were able to just kind of put the cigarette pack down, say I'm done, and walk away. Like I think many of us know someone who's done that, but that person is relatively few and far between, especially today. But we've made tremendous strides. But there's still a lot more work to be done. And these data were from this past summer's morbidity and, week, and mortality weekly report on the tobacco use among adults. So I'll just take you through some of the data. So if you look at it by sex, and you may not be able to see this very well, but one, oh, another thing I want to point out is that the um, now in this report, which is a little different from the past, they're including not just cigarettes, but total tobacco use. So I think even in the field of tobacco, we're not really going to just be focused on, you know, did people quit smoking cigarettes, but what is their total tobacco use? So the overall total tobacco use in the country is 21.3%, and traditionally it's been more males than females using tobacco-related uh, products. And then when you look just at cigarettes, 17%, 19% males, and 15 females. And then when you look by race ethnicity, there are, um, these data are very consistent. The numbers have changed somewhat to go down, except in a couple of groups. We're really not seeing much um, benefit so far when you look at Native American populations, individuals who identify as other or mixed heritage tend to have higher smoking rates. And this is a, a very underrepresented population in the literature. Um, but overall, we can see that you know, by race ethnicity, there are certain populations that have less smoking prevalence. Asian, non-Hispanics have traditionally been lower on tobacco use, as have, as have Hispanics. But I'd say with Hispanics, because this is such a heterogeneous group of people with so many different nationalities, that that can be quite misleading. When you really take a deeper dive into that, you see that those numbers vary significantly. Um, and then, of course, when you look at indicators of socioeconomic status, we know that there are uh, health disparities tobacco use disparities and cessation disparities by when you look by education. For some reason, individuals with a GED have the highest smoking rate. So this is about, of, of any tobacco product, 50% and 44% still among um, cigarette smokers. And then, you know, you, essentially with education and with income, you have this, in, this robust inverse association um, with tobacco use of all types. And then when you look by sexual orientation, this is another uh, population 
who we really need to focus more in the literature. Individuals who identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual have higher smoking rates compared to individuals who identify as heterosexual. And this is um, a group that is underrepresented in the literature, has unique cu cultural concerns that need to be attended to. So that's, I think, an opportunity for work in the future, as is a focus on smokers with mental illness, which is certainly gaining traction in the tobacco control movement. We know, we've known for a long time, that individuals who report, um, that smokers report higher levels of depression, of anxiety, and of other psychiatric problems, comorbid drug use, alcoholism, other psychiatric diagnoses. Um, and certainly, there are interventions that are targeting various um, mental health concerns and the relationship with smoking. Schizophrenia, you know, almost 70 to 80 percent of individuals diagnosed with schizophrenia are current smokers. So this is an area that I think um, we're also going to see more of a focus on with regard to improving the efficacy of our current evidence-based intervention approaches. So what I find interesting, I guess because I've been doing this for so long, um, is that I still am asked these questions when I meet someone new and they find out I'm a psychologist who studies tobacco use. Sometimes they're really confused. They don't really see the relationship between psychology and tobacco use. To me, it makes perfect sense, but people quite regularly ask this question. So this is Dr. Drobes. He is a preeminent clinical health psychologist who has made substantial contributions to understanding um, Q reactivity, which is a theory and a, and a treatment for smoking, and, um, and relapse prevention. So let's hope that this works. OK, so I can tell you basically he was talking about um, the role of uh, health psychologists with regard to how, how we fit in as um, a field in the larger landscape of tobacco use. So he was talking about all of the different disciplines who focus in on tobacco use practice and research. And of course, we have um, medicine, public health, nursing, epi, policy, lots of policy. I mean, policy has been um, huge in the tobacco control movement. And then you have different uh, domains of psychology that also focus on tobacco control, including cognitive and social psychology and health psychology, I think really does represent a centerpiece for, especially when you think about tobacco use interventions. There really is um, no other field who has made the same level of contributions as health psychologists have. And we've been thinking about this for a long time. So in this article that was published in 1982, at this point, you can see what, what was being thought about. Multi-component programs in terms of tobacco treatment interventions. And we still talk about multi-component interventions. But at this, at this point, aversion therapy seemed to be most effective. Who's familiar with aversion therapy? OK. So aver and I'll tell you a little bit more about it. But aversion therapy, we don't do that anymore. Um, but aversion <laughs> therapy was what we focused on then. There was initial evidence for nicotine gum. Um, that was thought that might become a useful adjunct, adjunct to behavioral <clears throat> strategies, and there was developing interest in biochemical measures of smoking. And now, you know, it's the gold standard that we must biochemically verify reports of smoking abstinence. And at that time, it wasn't saliva copine that we used, it was saliva, saliva thiocyanate. So it was interesting the things that were being discussed in the past. Uh -oh. <laughs> and, uh, uh oh. No, no audio. How does that happen? You just take it out and just make it play its regular sound of the computer. Would that work? So you couldn't hear it loud, but you, yeah. you think you could hear it? Well, I've unplugged the audio thing that she has in here, but I still don't hear her. All right. Plug it back in. The lap time volume is up. Huh. It never fails. I know. It worked when the room was empty. Okay, well, that's a bummer. Because they really add a lot of interesting points. Any other thoughts? Nobody? Lauren? Yeah, I know. Yeah. After we have wondered. All I can say is that you started over. Huh? All I can say is that you started over. What about the suggestion of not having the audio projection, but just. If it's what? Plugged in? I don't know. <laughs> 
And Lauren, I know in the past with the white, the little clicker. Yeah, the clicker is on this one. It's, it's on high. Mm -hmm. On high. Mm -hmm. It was, but we had it, like we haven't touched anything. We, since yeah, since we went morning. through every video this morning. We did. We went through. Is it part of inside the PowerPoint? <coughs> it's it, yeah. They are embedded in the PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. They're in the PowerPoint. So when you get there, you should just be able to click on it, and mm -hmm. it goes. And it is going. You just can't hear it. Here. So is there a setting within the actual PowerPoint itself that has a volume control on it? There might be, but when I mean the. <laughs> Actually, this this is, morning, and it, 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 yeah, and then we didn't touch it. We've practiced this for two days straight. Mm -hmm. This has been yeah. yeah. Huh? <laughs> um, I mean, fortunately, yeah. I don't think I'll take the whole time, so I guess you know, we could take a second to figure this out. Yeah. It would make a big difference, but yeah, no worries. <laughs> no. So if you play that, can you, if you want to play it, uh, unplug it, and see if it's play from the laptop. <laughs> Bathroom break? <laughs> no. Uh, yeah. No. Okay. Don't right. don't move. It's gonna don't happen. Move. They will have audio. Play it. No one has no volume. The volume is broken. There's okay. something on the laptop. Well, we'll make them available. Yeah. Uh, so so they are actually if proprietary that, videos. Oh, they are. Okay. okay. So the answer is no. Yeah. 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 Sorry about that, everyone. That would have been very nice. But um, so what she was going to be talking about is the the also the focus on secondhand smoke. Um, and we know that secondhand smoke kills about 4,000 people annually. So these are never smokers who are exposed to smoke in various situations at home, at workplaces. And in the past, you know, in the 80s and such, before Clean Indoor Air Act, people were allowed to smoke any and everywhere. Um, and, you know, you'd be on airplanes and things that we couldn't even really fathom now that were allowed um, at the time. And when you look at uh, research currently going on, we're still learning about the, the impact of secondhand smoke on infants in utero and um, language development. For example, um, this study was talking about how nicotine exposure um, among fetuses impacts language development later on in life. So they are more likely to have language delays if they're expo exposed to nicotine in utero. And there's also, um, you know, lots of still interesting reviews being published talking about the need to reduce um, childhood tobacco smoke exposure um, and finding that this work can really continue to impact policy and practice because when you think about it, there are, there are 30 states that have some form of a clean indoor air policy, but that still means that there are a significant number of states who still don't. And when you look at the map, you notice that those states without in the gray are mostly in the south mostly in the southeast that don't have any policy. The green are the most restrictive policies. Um, and then in, like in Florida, for example, you can smoke um, in smoke free in most indoor workplaces, but not bars. So bars, if they have a certain amount of food being served, that's when it becomes more like a restaurant and you can't smoke there. But otherwise, you can still go to the bar where it's mostly just alcohol being served in Florida and still smoke. So still, there's more policy and more evidence needed to help convince, especially these southern, south, southeastern states, that it's important to have clean indoor air acts. Just try it for kicks. <laughs> Come on, Robin, you can do it. Just for kicks. Yeah. Yeah. She's going to talk. Well, we'll pretend we can hear her. Um, oh. You hear something, right? You, you heard something? For a second. Really? I didn't a word. Your imagination. No. Okay. So, as with most things, there is a continuum of tobacco control, and the work of health psychologists has really been to develop interventions and focus on predictors of these various aspects of the tobacco control continuum, ranging from when people begin to smoke um, and secondhand smoke exposure to the current use of tobacco, <laughs> the process of quitting, which is very challenging, as we know, for people, and then the morbidity and mortality that is the result of many years of smoking. And um, in terms of nicotine and its effect on our brain, you know, when you inhale a cigarette, 
within 10 to 20 seconds, the nicotine reaches your brain. And it affects the dopaminergic system in our brain, which is our reward pathway. And um, there are more nicotine receptors in your brain than there are for any other substance, any other drug, which is why smoking is so reinforcing and the most addictive of any other drugs. People are always surprised when we tell them, especially in intervention context, that this will be harder, bless you, for those who are in recovery, this will be harder than it was for you to stop using heroin or to stop you know, smoking crack. And they find that hard to believe, but that's partly because of the way nicotine reinforces our brain and it really leads us down that pathway. So now new, um, the newest FDA-approved smoking cessation aid Varenicline is designed to sort of inhibit, it's an agonist for this dopa, uh, dopaminergic pathway so that smoking can hopefully become less rewarding and people will be more likely to abstain. Um, and then you think about why is it so hard for people to stop smoking? Why do people have such difficulty quitting? I think for non-smokers, it can be difficult to really understand in this day and age with everything that we know, why people still smoke and why they pick it up. Well, the data actually show that it only takes, especially among adolescents, there's data showing that it only takes three cigarettes, three, before a person becomes nicotine dependent or becomes addicted. So it doesn't take much. You don't have to be a long-term smoker. You don't have to smoke for four or five years or even one year. After three cigarettes, um, the addiction process can begin. So when people um, become nicotine dependent, they have a cigarette, the nicotine quickly gets to their brain, then they start to feel better, they start to feel more relaxed, and then the nicotine levels start to fall. So here's another point where clinical psychology and clinical health psychology has really been influential, is understanding the withdrawal process. So what happens after that last cigarette and how long does it take before a person enters nicotine withdrawal? And data by uh, colleagues of mine suggest that it only takes about 30 minutes after the person's last cigarette before they begin to enter nicotine withdrawal. And that means that they start to have symptoms like cravings and urges, irritability, difficulty concentrating. It, that only happens after about 30 minutes. So some people find it difficult um, and their cravings tend to mount the longer they have to wait before they can go outside and have, and have another cigarette. It's easier when they're at home. Um, and the best way to eliminate nicotine withdrawal is to have another cigarette and to reduce that craving. And so at this point, you know, when they have the craving for a cigarette because they've entered nicotine withdrawal, then you have cognitive and behavioral processes that begin, where they start to say, I really want to smoke, I really feel restless. And at a certain point, these processes become automatic. They're really kind of unconscious because they've done this for so long that it's just sort of automatic and they're not really thinking about why they're desiring a cigarette at that point. They just know that it's time to go out. When they walk out to the car, as soon as they walk out the door, the first thing that they're, do is, that they're doing is lighting their cigarette. Um, and then the cycle just starts over again. So the, our job as interventionists in um, this process is to try to intervene at the point um, where people are going through nicotine withdrawal and help them work through the nicotine withdrawal process, which taken together, if you're successful and you don't smoke, you don't have any lapses, is about two weeks, the hardest part of getting over the addiction. Um, or getting over the, the major parts of the addiction. They'll always think about smoking. You know, Long-term smokers will tell you, you know, it's been 20 years since I had a cigarette, but man, a cigarette would be great right now. Or they walk past someone and the person's smoking and they're, you know, trying to sniff it because they're like, man, that smells good. So the process doesn't ever stop, really, but it just becomes the, the first two to three weeks is the most difficult part for people to get through. All right. Um, so another major contribution, and that was, I will say, this is my graduate school mentor, Thomas Brandon. We were great friends, and he has really been instrumental in understanding the role between mood processes and negative affect in the relationship with smoking, and has developed many evidence-based interventions that are being nationally disseminated. Um, and so his, his focus is sort of theory-based models and talking about how, you know, health psychology really has contributed models and added to the existing models in, that you find in sort of the classic psychology literature. So for example, classical condi conditioning is what forms the basis of our interventions. Um, you know, we, people don't really think about that they're behaving like one of Pavlov's dogs um, when they're smoking, but they are learning. And when we tell people about their triggers to smoke, their cues to smoke, their risky situations, what we're talking about is classical conditioning, a basic behavioral model from early psychology. Um, and then when you look back in the day at the literature, people were talking lots about um, cue reactivity and the cues as determinants, the cues as determinants of smoking, and people are still focused on classical conditioning. Um, and that's kind of where we were, and thinking about how the classical conditioning model, so the reason why 
if someone drinks a cup of coffee in the, right after they've quit smoking, why that sets them up to be more likely to relapse if they're used to pairing coffee with smoking, things that really have no connection, but after you've paired it for so long, they just go hand in hand, or alcohol use, and, and, or marijuana, or you know, just walking outside, just taking a break, just getting on the phone, getting in your car, any number of situations, it becomes so ingrained into the fabric of, people that, of, of people's lives that it makes it very difficult to stop smoking. Um, another major model that we still use and, and really is one of the underlying um, frameworks for all of our interventions, all of our sort of psychology-based interventions for tobacco um, cessation comes from operant conditioning. So this is basic learning theory that helps us understand how we can increase the probability of people repeating behavior and how we can eliminate behavior, how we can decrease the probability. So for example, when we bring people into our smoking clinic, we often have them do behavioral contracts with themselves. So they will make a commitment to quit smoking just for a brief period of time. And if they're successful, then we treat them with a small gift or we ask them to treat themselves with a small gift. So that's positive reinforcement. Um, and then if they are unsuccessful, for example, then we ask them to do something that they don't really want to do that they would find difficult to do, like give up your cell phone for 24 hours. Like that's a big deal that you know you can't function without your cell phone. But we do these things and some people really are um, very responsive to reinforcement. And when we have our <coughs> smoking station groups and our individual therapies, we offer lots of positive negative reinforcement and various forms of punishment as a part of the intervention. And when you look at the models, <coughs> these are theoretical models. These are, I'd say, the primary theoretical models that have formed the basis of um, how health psychology has contributed to the tobacco control movement by looking at certain psychological constructs that are predictive of cessation and predictive of relapse, um, and even of, in some cases can predict the initiation of smoking as well. So cognitive, uh, social cognitive theory, which is you know all the way back in the days of Bandura, this model probably has been the most influential with regard to thinking about how outcome expectancies and the importance of goal settings and dealing with impediments or risk factors um, for smoking. And then you have other more recent um, health psychology specific models like the health belief model, which is still commonly used, and more recently pr uh, protection motivation theory. So overall I'd say that um, the, the evidence base, most of the evidence base for the tobacco cessation literature has come from health psychology with understanding how um, people use tobacco and what things influence their use of the products, and then developing effective interventions. Okay. So and earlier, uh, in one of the articles I mentioned that it was saying it, aversion therapy was the therapy. So I'll just tell you what that means, because it comes from um, these classic models of behavior. And at the time, and right at the tail end when I started graduate school, people were still doing a bit of aversion therapy, where you bring people into the laboratory, and the goal is to create an aversion to something. So in this case, tobacco, you want them to create an aversion so that they don't desire a cigarette. So what you do is you bring them into the laboratory or the clinical setting, and you have them smoke. You have them get their cigarettes out, and you have them smoke back to back. Just keep on smoking. And what happens is they then understand the, what smoking is actually doing to their body, but it's usually over you know, a paced out period uh, over a course of a day, but when they rapid, it's called rapid smoking, when they smoke rapidly, they see how their blood levels are being deprived of oxygen, they start to turn green. You, so you see people, they see themselves start to turn green, they start to vomit. After about smoking 20 cigarettes back to back, you're green, you're vomiting, and it creates an aversion. So we bring people into the lab and have them go through multiple trials of aversion therapy. We don't do this anymore, um, <laughs> but it was, it was an approach from the past. So this is kind of what we do now, and this is what guides the whole field in terms of treatment for tobacco use. And these are our clinical practice guidelines, which are based on thousands of studies, mostly from clinical psychologists, some of those you would have heard from today. Um, and this is kind of what we use to form the many meta-analyses of the whole literature to say these are the evidence-based approaches um, to treatment. And in general, the clinical practice guidelines say that the more treatment people can get, the more intensive treatment people can get, the better, but that even minimal level interventions, um, even a brief message from a medical provider is important and leads to a greater probability of quitting compared to receiving no intervention at all. And you can think about intervention, self-help, and in general, in sort of three broad categories. And those would be the standard interventions, targeted and tailored. People use the terms tailored and targeted interchangeably, but there's actually some distinction between them. 
So standard interventions are kind of, you know, the one-size-fits-all approach. You read um, a brochure on how to quit smoking. It's just designed for the general population of smokers. Then you have targeted interventions, and these would be designed for the subgroups of smokers that we went through earlier. So if you wanted to develop an intervention that addressed the specific and unique needs of the LGBT community, then you would have a targeted intervention for that population. Um, tailoring occurs at the individual level. Um, so these are when every, you know, you kind of conduct a baseline assessment, and it's kind of like intelligent responding. It's like how Amazon knows, well, because you bought this, so now we're going to send you these things. That's essentially what tailoring does. So everyone gets a different, based on an algorithm, they receive a different intervention. And then um, there are interventions that really fall in the targeted category, but they're called culturally tailored. I use the term culturally specific, um, but you'll see these, you know, interventions, some people call them culturally appropriate, culturally responsive, culturally competent. There's a, a variety of names, but mostly these refer to the same thing. Um, and these are important because we really understand that although there, we know how people can quit smoking, it doesn't work for everyone. It's certainly not a one-size-fits-all situation. And in our evidence-based interventions, the efficacy of them could be improved by, well, first, greater uptake of the interventions or greater dissemination of the interventions, but making sure that they really address the concerns of unique populations. And that's one thing that I certainly focus a lot on. A lot on. This is a seminal study from someone you would have heard from um, who was talking about the, um, at this point, she was talking about the, uh, the first-line pharmacotherapies, which remain the first-line pharmacotherapies, nicotine gum, nicotine patch, bupropion. Now we also have Chantix. And this was one of the first reviews that showed that if you combine a first-line pharmacotherapy with a behavioral <coughs> intervention, you double your chances of being successful. So this is really an important message for people to understand who just prefer, you know, most smokers prefer to just quit cold turkey. Um, oh, I really wish you could have heard from them. So this gentleman is James Prochaska, and this is his daughter, Jody Prochaska. James Prochaska you might be familiar with if you're familiar with the trans-theoretical model, the stages of change model. That's his model, uh, Prochaska and DiClemente, one of the, the most cited model in all of um, in all of psychology and even broader. Everybody knows the stage of change model, so he had a nice message um, that you won't be able to hear. But that's him. They live in California. He's doing very well. Um, and uh, so he was talking about the importance of this model as one, and it is one of the major contributions of health psychology to the field. And you know, this was one of the models that really brought about the, the intelligent responding is what we're kind of now calling it, but ta individual tailoring, where the notion was that we, can't, we have to meet smokers where they are. We have to think about their readiness to make a behavior change and the different messages that we might deliver depending on where they fall in their stages and their stage of change, ranging from no thoughts of quitting to maintaining abstinence for a long period of time. So these studies were published in the 80s. That is where you first start to see studies based on um, Prochaska's model and talking about the pros and cons of smoking. They developed a number of measures that we still use to assess um, decisional balance, which is the pros and cons of smoking. And um, also looking at constructs like Bandura's construct are, are a part of this model as well, thinking about self-efficacy and the importance of people developing self-efficacy or the, the confidence in their ability to change. Um, and as you went on, there were just more and more studies. It was, there was a point where if you wrote a grant application and you didn't include the stages of change model as part of your outcomes, there was no way you were going to get very far. Um, times have changed a little bit, I'd say, since that point, well, pretty significantly as, as it relates to this. But at this point, the notion was that this model, compared to other types of um, of intervention approaches resulted in overall, the expert system is their tailored intervention, resulted in the, the highest population impact overall. Because these were not face-to-face -face interventions which generally produced the highest effect sizes, but they were individually tailored. So everyone received messages that were delivered in theory for, for them. Um, and these, this model was applied to adolescent smoking, special populations delivered in clinical settings. I mean, it really was everywhere. It focused on the predictors of relapse and use for relapse prevention. Um, and then it sort of slowed down because people started to criticize, if you recall, the model. And one of the biggest critics of the model is Tad Herzog. He's not at the University of Hawaii. but he was among those who started to question the validity of the model. And if you recall, the model said things like, you know, are you ready to quit smoking in the next six months, 30 days? And he questioned, you know, where did these, where are these arbitrary? And Petraska admitted 
that this was kind of arbitrary, but it worked. Um, but he developed a series of studies, as did others, beginning to kind of really take a closer look at the model and decide that it was not really predicting stage movement. People weren't progressing through the stages as, you, as a stage model would suggest. And then other um, interventions that were based on this theory either were showing no effect or in some case the opposite effect when you match the intervention to a person's stage of change. Um, and even, my, even I got in a little bit on it, um, published a couple of studies looking at, well, maybe people aren't necessarily responding to this theory, but they are responding to another psychological construct, which is a placebo. So I theorize that perhaps people were just responding to the idea that this intervention was created for me, and maybe that knowledge, and then seeing something that was highly personalized, maybe that knowledge would be enough to instigate change and, and facilitate cognitive processing of the message. And essentially, that's what I found in the randomized trial, that just providing people with something that they believe is tailored based on, it, based on an assessment, even though it's actually not, and it's generally the standard approach, but you have their name in it, you have other characteristics, very superficial, was enough to promote um, smoking cessation compared to its standard counterpart. So where we are now, I'd say, is this model is still a good descriptor. We don't really use it much anymore. You don't see it in grant applications anymore. You see a few studies still talking about it. But in general, it's not. But it makes, it's still a good descriptor. Because if I talk to someone who understands anything about not only tobacco use, but behavior change in general, right? If you're talking about physical activity or actually, I mean, you understand if I say, oh, she's in contemplation. She's a pre-contemplator. We all know what that means. So it still carries, I think, great descriptive value and helps at least clinicians and researchers understand what population or what group of people we're talking about. Um, our current gold standard in terms of treatment for smoking cessation is cognitive behavioral therapy. This is the gold standard treatment that we use in, in psychology to treat a range of disorders, mood disorders, anxiety disorders, things on axis one, things on axis two like bipolar disorder. And really the goal of cognitive behavioral therapy, it's a, it's a directive form of psychotherapy that emphasizes the interrelationships between your thoughts, your feelings, and your behavior and teaching people um, new ways to think and new ways to behave and how you know, all of these things are very much connected. And so CBT for smoking cessation has been developed. And this is um, Dr. Bretzler, uh, my graduate school advisor, developed one of the most evidence-based um, CBT interventions for smoking cessation. Could be delivered in a group or an individual format. And essentially, people are brought in. He had an intervention that was six sessions. I've said, since expanded it, so now it's eight sessions plus nicotine replacement. And what they found in these early studies published in the mid-90s and the late-80s was that at the end of the intervention, almost everybody was successful. So this was the intervention that I was trained on as a graduate student. And even still, you know, maybe it wasn't 98%, but it was at least 80% of people who came in were, uh, were quitting smoking and going on and maintaining that for six months to 12 months, which is really amazing. One thing that I noted, though, is that the samples were mostly white, middle-aged, middle-class um, individuals. So it didn't really include representation from the people who are currently doing the most smoking. Uh, this is what CBT for smoking cessation consists of. So I know you can't see it all. You don't need to see it all. They come in for orientation. They receive, um, in this case, I added two sessions because people were saying that six sessions just wasn't enough. So now there are two booster sessions that they receive. And it's not, it's not a class. People talk about smoking cessation classes. There are smoking cessation classes that you can attend if you go to you know, the American Lung Association or ACS or something like that. CBT, however, is therapy. People should be experiencing um, cathartic moments, you know, aha moments. They should be experiencing therapeutic change. They should understand more about their um, psychiatric, the psychiatric influences on their behavior. So some of the things that are included in the CBT for smoking cessation, certainly we focus on a coping response training model. We talk specifically about coping responses using the cognitive behavioral framework. We talk a lot about the relationship between stress and smoking and negative affect. We use behavioral activation, which is a classic approach to treat depression. Um, we also talk about, uh, we also use relaxation training, which is another sort of classic CBT approach that you wouldn't see in a typical you know, smoking cessation class. And so a large part of what I'm interested in is how do we expand and how do we make these interventions more relevant to others? If CBT is so effective in the sort of general mainstream white middle class population, maybe it could be effective among others who just may have not had exposure to it. And I think that we, we have to think about how do we address tobacco cessation disparities 
from an intervention perspective. I mean, one of the major differences between a psychologist and someone who studies public health is our focus is more on the at the individual level. And there are certainly drawbacks and, and there's a tension, I think, with that. We, we need to do a better job of disseminating these individual level interventions, but we need to understand what's going on you know, at the individual level. Um, so I think health psychology has a really important role in helping us understand, but not only understand and look at predictive relationships, but how to actually address tobacco-related disparities. And this is important because there are certain populations who experience a disproportionate burden from all the, the medical conditions we know to be associated or caused by tobacco use. The most robust and most pervasive disparities are found when you compare African Americans to white Americans, although there's also evidence that, for example, among Hispanics who tend to be a healthier demographic, the longer they've been here, the, the less healthy they become. That's sort of true of all immigrants. Um, and that the leading causes of death for this population are actually also smoking related. So, um, and another reason that this is important to think about is because there are, um, there is evidence that robust evidence that smoking cessation rates differ by race ethnicity, where African Americans and Hispanics are significantly, generally less likely to quit smoking compared to white smokers. So I spent a lot of time thinking about why that might be, what things can we do to address these issues, um, and the first thing that I decided to do, um, I'm really getting into kind of CBT for smoking cessation, apply to racial ethnic minorities, was to say, okay, well let's first look at the general CBT for smoking cessation that has these really high effects rate, effect sizes. And let's see in a randomized trial if we also get the same significant effects and we see high effect sizes among African Americans. So this study was our smoke break study and essentially we brought people in and they received compared to a health education control group which was just sort of general health education. All the sessions were time matched and we controlled for all of those variables that potentially could confound. And what we found was essentially we, we um, we tracked people for six months after the end of counseling, and we found significant across the board um, that CBT was significantly more beneficial than our general health education, health education control group. At the end of therapy, we had over 60% of people who were confirmed to be absent at that time. Of course, you see relapse along the way, um, but in general, it suggested to me that CBT in its standard form could be uh, applicable and generalizable to African American smokers. One thing I noted, however, uh, was the importance of looking at individual differences, right? We can't broad stroke any group of people. And that, I think, is probably the danger of culturally tailored or culturally specific interventions. Yes? Can you just go back to that? I just have a quick question. Sure. Did you know, were, were the relapse rates similar across the two? Yes, they were. They were, so, yeah. so regardless of? Absolutely. The, they were, the rate of decline over time, that's a great question, was the same in, in, in both conditions. Um, so I think it's important that we look at mechanisms of change to kind of understand why interventions work and for whom they work, because they don't work for everyone. So we, we really need to kind of d deep, I think, a little, um, dive a little deeper to really understand that. And some people look at that, um, and they have found things like the change in negative affect, um, improvements in negative affect to increase the likelihood of long-term cessation after ex uh, experiencing cognitive behavioral therapy and other variables like motivation to quit, levels of social support. So these are things that I spend time thinking about, but I'm also thinking about how do I target this at the group, at the subgroup level to make interventions more culturally specific and then also think about it from a biobehavioral perspective. And earlier I talked about the different levels of interventions. Well, culturally specific intervention is a form of targeting and it is, um, should be guided by formative work and empirical work. And what, what we do with these interventions is it, you know, take, in this case, an adapted uh, version of an evidence-based intervention where we are infusing different cultural values that are representative of the group in general, right? Because not everybody within that group may have those same values. But we incorporate that into the intervention. And what I found in some uh, studies um, is that people in general prefer, these are smokers, these are African American smokers who received either a culturally specific, a written culturally specific set of materials or a standard matched counterpart. And overall people preferred the content and they gave higher ratings on the culturally specific version, but in this study it was kind of the opposite effect in terms of their motivation to quit or which intervention controlling for baseline led to greater motivation. It was the standard intervention, and I thought that that was really um, definitely counterintuitive and wanted to investigate it further, looking at a variable uh, that is level of acculturation. People usually measure acculturation when it comes to recent immigrant populations, 
but acculturation is also relevant and um, predicts smoking among African Americans, such that individuals with a, a lower level of acculturation, which means a more affinity and tie to their traditional African American culture, um, might have a different response compared to someone who says, you know, I'm more, um, I identify as Christian before I identify as African American. So that's what's more important to me. You know, that, that you know, Level of acculturation varies on the continuum across people. And that's basically what we found, was that the people who responded the best in terms of who liked this culturally specific material were people who were lower on higher scores here, means that they're higher on the, um, that they're more traditional in their African American cultural orientation. So those were the individuals who tended to prefer this content. And the same with the motivation to quit measure, which is the contemplation ladder. We found that, um, we found a crossover interaction. So people who received in the dark line, the culturally specific intervention, if they were over here, and or uh, along this side of the continuum meeting, these are culturally traditional African Americans, they did experience greater motivation to change their behavior, greater readiness to quit smoking. And you had the opposite effect. So it's almost harm if, if you mismatch the intervention and you give an intervention, you say, oh, this person's African American, so here's your intervention. But you didn't do anything to really think about does this apply at that level. Um, so this is an example. Sorry? That was the opposite direction. This is also the opposite direction. This was uh, a measure of 24 hour, the odds of 24 hour point prevalence abstinence. And here we also found the opposite effect of what you would expect. And our explanation for that could be that the, the attention to the theory based content could have actually distracted from the message that people were receiving. In this particular study, we had a lot of people call. We were using an intervention that's called Pathways to Freedom, which is nationally disseminated and, you know, it refers to this Freeman family. And Freeman. They referred to the Freeman family. And it was your family. And uh, they were talking. And so some people called and said, oh, well, tell us about this Freeman family. Like, they got really into the story. And I wondered if that had any relationship to why, in this case, we saw the opposite. But it was a pilot study, so I wasn't sure. And I didn't want to over-speculate. So what we then decided to do was to test in our group intervention that we know is successful, or at least efficacious among African Americans. What if we decide, what if we adapt that so that it's culturally specific? So here, um, the topics were the same. So everyone received standard CBT. The sessions were matched. So this is a randomized control trial where the, the sessions are matched. But within each session, we discussed topics that would not be discussed in traditional CBT. For example, we talk about the relationship between um, the tobacco industry and African Americans. We talk about menthol smoking, which is much more prevalent among African Americans, almost everybody. We talk about stressors that are unique to African Americans, like discrimination and racism, things that you would never discuss in a typical smoking cessation <laughs> intervention. We talk about um, mood and depression, but specifically as it relates to African Americans. When it comes to uh, weight gain, which is a, a major concern among people trying to quit smoking, there's evidence that African Americans who quit smoking tend to be super gainers or gain even more than the traditional six to 10 pounds. So we talk about that. Um, we talk about environmental influences. I mean, it's really, we talk about the community and, mo and mobilizing to fight against the tobacco industry so that it really becomes hopefully more culturally specific and the topics that are discussed are still using the, the evidence-based framework offered by CBT, but making it more specific to the group. Um, and what we found in, a trial, in this trial that we recently published, we found an overall effect um, such that there was an incremental benefit of receiving our culturally specific CBT. When you look at all time points combined in a, gener in a sort of generalized estimating equation type model. Mm -hmm. um, when you look by the individual time point, you see where there are significant differences, but you see when you get out 6 and 12 months, there really wasn't much of a, much of a benefit. You still see the changes in the right, the numbers are in the right direction, but not uh, statistically significant. And the relapse rate is high. There was no interaction with, um, with that um, at time points in terms of the rate of decline was the same across the conditions. But we see that there is at least some short-term benefit and an overall effect compared to the standards. So I think that there is some incremental benefit. Um, we're in the process of conducting analyses to understand who might be, you know, responding the best to our culturally specific intervention. I've also done the same thing when it, uh, as it relates to Hispanics, finding, and this was a brief, um, at this point of when we published this study, um, there were only five randomized controlled trials that had investigated um, smoking cessation interventions among Hispanics, of all, you know, at all, which is really limited. This one, however, that had the highest effect sizes um, 
is a, is a, a cognitive behavioral therapy-based intervention trial. So even in this group, you can see the benefits of cognitive behavioral therapy. And we followed up with studies kind of developing culturally specific um, smoking cessation messages uh, targeting Hispanic smokers and also focused on preferred language. Do you prefer to receive the intervention in Spanish or would you prefer the content in English? And essentially we find that this intervention um, also demonstrated some positive effects. Not everything was exactly as as hypothesized, but overall we saw that language preference made a significant difference for people in terms of um, their overall outcome, as did some of the culturally specific elements. Okay, and then, um, so the last part of what I'm gonna talk about is this model, which really is a, um, one of the major contributions it's the model that we think about more now than we do like the stages of change type of model. But the biopsychosocial model was really um, health psychology, behavioral medicine's response to the biomedical model, which really just focused on biological factors and looking at people like a list of symptoms. And this model says, well, we really need to think about the interplay between a person's psychological state, their social status, and their biological status to understand health and wellness. Um, so this model is very influential for me. Um, I'm interested in, as an underlying mechanism, distress <clears throat> processes and thinking about how um, distress might help, help us understand why certain populations have a harder time quitting smoking. Stress and depression together we conceptualize as distress. And there's evidence that, I mean, robust evidence showing that um, these variables are associated with tobacco use, cessation, relapse, even initiation, and that ethnic racial minorities and individuals of lower socioeconomic status <coughs> independently and thinking about that from an intersectionality kind of approach, experience greater exposure to various stressors. So we published a study looking at, um, looking at how CBT, um, after going through CBT, what happens with people's levels of distress. And we looked at it by race, ethnicity, and essentially what we found was that African American came in at a disadvantage with ex uh, greater experience of perceived stress and depressive symptoms. But when we, and this I think is probably where I want to focus today, is the change um, between coming in and ending the therapy, African Americans and Hispanics experienced significant improvement, the negative numbers mean improvement, in their overall experience of both stress and depression. And our white participants really didn't have much change here. Um, also, I'll note that overall in the sample, when you look at the total sample numbers, and this is the CESD, which is a measure of depressive symptomatology, um, the sample is depressed. I mean, smokers are, tend to be depressed. The clinical cutoff for the CESD is 16. The total sample was 20.7. So overall, the sample is depressed. But when you look at change, our ethnic racial minorities were having the greatest change. So we decided to try to understand. And the other thing I, I don't have here is the cessation rates from this study were high and in the opposite direction for most studies, which in our research shows that um, in this particular study, the um, ethnic racial minorities, in this case Hispanics and African Americans, had higher smoking cessation rates compared to their white counterparts, which is quite different from what you generally see. And this partially explains that. So the, it was the change in perceived stress. When you, This is the unadjusted <coughs> model. But when you add in perceived stress or add depression into the model, this significant relationship showing that African Americans were more likely to quit smoking compared to our white participants is no longer significant when you account for the positive change in perceived stress and depression. So that suggests that there's a mediating relationship that might explain that. I've also looked at this um, from a biobehavioral perspective, saying, well, you know, people report stress, and there's evidence that even just self-reports of stress uh, have implications for health. But I also think it's important that we kind of look at it objectively. And one way we do that is to measure saliva cortisol, which is like our primary peripheral biomarker of stress. Um, Cortisol should have a diurnal rhythm, so when you wake up in the morning, 30 minutes after you wake up, your, your cortisol level should increase, and then it should show a decline over the course of the day. And in this study, we compared white and black smokers coming into our CBT. We assessed them at baseline, the end of therapy, and at a one-month follow-up. The red line is African Americans. The blue line it represents um, our um, self-identified white participants. And what you can see is the, the lines among African Americans are more flat, and um, in, this is essentially an indicator of hypo-responsivity to our stress response system. Um, and it's an indicator of cumulative chronic stress and it's also an indicator of a number of stress-related medical conditions. Um, and at baseline, before we started the intervention, you had significant differences. We assessed cortisol four different time points throughout the day. They were different at all time points. The same thing at the end of therapy. But when we look at them a month later, um, we saw some recovery of function among African American smokers where, they were, where their lines were a little bit more in sync. And, and toward the end of the day, which is important, 
for repair and preparation for the next day, your nighttime, your, your evening cortisol levels are key for repairing and, and dealing with the stressors of the day, we didn't see any significant differences. So where we are with this work now is I have a randomized trial um, that I left in, in Florida. It's a multi-site randomized trial being conducted in Miami and in Tampa to follow this up because um, this suggests that CBT may have a benefit for both elimination of smoking cessation disparities and for reducing perceived and physiological stress among um, Af African Americans, potentially Hispanic smokers. Um, so we're conducting a randomized trial with a control group to actually understand if that relationship is causally related to, um, to CBT. So my revision of the biopsychosocial model is to add the cultural component to that. I think that there's a unique, um, a unique piece of this model that still is missing and that can be expanded upon if we think about unique uh, cultural influences. Okay, so going in the future, I think in the field overall, we're seeing more influence from um, other kinds of new theories that are emerging. You have more the um, acceptance and commitment therapy is now being applied to tobacco control, as is positive psychology, which I think are both great ideas. The allostasis model of health is a model that I'm interested in. It's the model that kind of looks at the allostatic load and the cumulative stroll of, uh, toll of stress on the body. Um, I think health psychology really needs to focus more on tobacco-related disparities. There's been some work, but clearly I think um, there's, there's room to, for improvement. Um, I think we'll see most interventions moving towards their primary outcome being total tobacco use versus just um, cigarette smoking. And obviously with the emergence of alternative and um, emerging products, this would be important. And then of course, it's important to try to not have these, you know, CBT often stays on the shelf. Um, and it needs to come off the shelf and really make it into the hands of local, national agencies. Um, there are different ways to do that, and I think that that is certainly important to capitalize on technology. There's lots of um, work uh, being proposed and being conducted, looking at smartphone applications that, that follow the sort of CBC framework or text messaging, or various forms of technology to try to increase the dissemination potential of this work. So um, I'm sorry you didn't get to see the videos, because that really would have been nice, but um, it happens. So, but thank you. Very interesting talk. Thank you very much. <clears throat> you didn't mention anything about hypnosis, clinical hypnosis, and its ability to reduce struggle. I did not, um, and the reason is because although people report and do have some success with clinical hypnosis, it's not one of our evidence-based interventions. It's not something that, um, yeah, that's in our clinical practice guidelines. It hasn't shown um, a, a substantial effect or a long-term long effect. But I know people who have, you know, just anecdotally said that that's how they quit smoking. Is that something that you are interested in? I'm interested in hypnosis and suggestion. Okay. Because it's yeah. suggestion, the person's prepared for suggestion. And that's part of what happens if people ask for help and come in. They're ready for suggestion. Mm -hmm. I agree. And, but things like hypnosis, acupuncture, things that, you know, sort of the alternative methodologies that people use, those are not considered evidence-based interventions. So it's not, yeah, something that typically we recommend. Go ahead. Um, thanks, great talk. I enjoyed it. Um, the CBT, it sounds like that is largely now one-on-one, -on -one, and you sort of alluded to um, other technologies or other strategies, and can you say just a little bit more about that and, you know, ways to disseminate more broadly? Sure. Um, my uh, general approach is the group-based approach. Um, we do give people the option in a general in our general smoking station clinic, which we're hopefully going to launch here this year. Um, people have the option of individual versus group. Um, but I think other ways to disseminate it would be, you know, online conversions, which people have certainly tried, um, and some have demonstrated effects that are, are positive. Um, I think the smartphone applications, especially those that can deliver, use the, kind of combine the application with EMA or ecological momentary assessment where you can kind of understand where people are in real time and then deliver messages that are important to them and helping them reframe and, and work through um, their urges to smoke and their risky situations. Those interventions are, are either being tested um, and certainly are being proposed all the time. So I think we'll see more of that. Yes. Do we have a sense of, within the folks who received the CBT but ended up relapsing, do we have a sense of what, what might be different between those folks and the ones who were able to maintain the, the success of therapy 
i.e., right, where the thinking is, you know, what, what additional intervention might those folks need? Is it just more of, you know, prolonged CD exposure to CBT, mm -hmm. or is it, do we think it's something else? Or? That is a really good and complicated question, I think, because I think it, it varies. I mean, we do have some indicators, um, the people who, at least the people who I usually see, who have been, who, uh, who continue to use marijuana or alcohol are much more likely to relapse. People who are younger are more likely to relapse. Um, people who um, have greater levels of stress at the end of therapy and report higher urges to smoke at the end of therapy still, so they're still in active withdrawal at the end of the therapy, are more likely to be unsuccessful. So it really, you know, people who have greater levels of poverty are more likely to be unsuccessful. So there's, and I'm sure, you know, the list would, would go on. Yes? With the introduction of uh, social and medical marijuana across the country, uh, is there any correlation between the tobacco use, marijuana use, as oh, far yes. as uh, uh, research and how it's going to affect the country in the future? Um, yes, I mean there's certainly a new there's a an emphasis now that's growing on the marijuana tobacco co-use problem. Uh, most of those studies are still pretty descriptive and trying to understand the prevalence of this issue. Um, there haven't been many um, certainly evidence-based interventions that are. Um, testing those together. I think they're underway, but we haven't really seen them in the published literature. I know in my clinic we have a substantial number of people who come in who smoke marijuana, and that's a difficult problem. Many of them say, I'm here to quit smoking cigarettes, I'm not here to stop smoking marijuana. The problem is they smoke weed in order to, um, and the cigarette enhances that high. So it's very difficult because of the conditioning for them to separate them, and we tell them, and they almost have a 100% relapse rate if they continue to smoke marijuana um, through the treatment, and, and even if they stop temporarily smoking cigarettes, they're almost sure, assuredly to relapse. Does the marijuana have uh, the same kind of uh, negative effects as uh, tobacco? Now this is a good question. Um, the marijuana's health effects are not as strong as tobacco, but it does have negative health effects. It's got negative effects on the pulmonary system, on the respiratory system. Right. People think, oh, it's a plant, it's good, like it's, you know, it's great, <laughs> but it does have health effects, but they're not as, you know, they're not as pronounced as the effects of tobacco. Thank you. Great presentation. Um, in thinking about your, the different health psychology models and the, and the kind of work that you're doing, how do you bring in the influence of context? So there's tailoring to the person, but also then tailoring to the, the context. Um, and, and what's that interplay, you know, within these kinds of interventions? Um, we do talk about context a lot, because when you're talking to people about their triggers and their conditioning, it's really about the context. So what are the contexts in which you are most likely to smoke? I just reviewed a grant that um, people were using the smartphone application and they developed a really interesting algorithm to help predict the context that people might be in when and try to deliver a message to intervene before they'd be likely to smoke. So even within the cognitive behavioral framework, we're still thinking about the context and, and certainly having to talk to people about what's going on in their lives. And that's one of the distinctions that makes it more than a class, I'd say, to really get into that with each person. And I guess as a follow-up, is there a layering when you have both changing of the context and the changing of how somebody responds to their context? I mean, you know, I think that's, mm -hmm. that's the, the challenge between the individual level and the population level. It's like, you know, can we make context easier for people to not smoke? or to eat healthier, whatever it is, while we're also teaching people right. skills to manage you know, the reality You're right. of the context. It's hard. It, it's hard, but we do attempt to do that with people. Interventions that have what I like about, and, and I think we'll you know, be moving more toward the mobile technology and the other for that reason as well, we do have to reach people in real time. Because when you're in the, you know, when you're talking to them on the phone or what, whether it's a quit line or in any other kind of face-to-face -face intervention, you're talking with them, but then they have to go back into their context, mm -hmm. and that's where the challenge is. So we need to find ways to try to intervene in the, in the real, in real time. Yes. My last thing, so I was just going to say, to me, one bigger picture question is how do you integrate these approaches with the public health approaches to almost like amplify each other? You know, the public health is approaches of doing like, how do you get this all out there? But then once you're out there, you have to have these targeted and tailored and mm -hmm. like all those things at the same time. That would seem like going to the other idea of like how do we drop tobacco the rate in Cleveland? It strikes me you can't do just this, can't just do the public health approach. You have to do both of these together. 
Mm -hmm. they truly affect them. Right. I mean, and I think the multi or the interdisciplinary teams are essential for yeah. for this to really go because someone like me is certainly more on the side of intervention development and understanding who it works for and why and being able to reach people. But then other people who focus on implementation need to be on the team to take it to the next level to say, well, this is how we can actually make this more usable at the larger scale. Um, there may be other questions. I think we probably need to wrap it up. This would be uh, mindful of people's time. Thank you very much for one great Thank talk. You. Thank you for the technology challenges. Uh, we appreciate the effort there. And, and doing this out. If you